Good morning, Pavel. Good morning, everyone. I'm Professor Hal Sosabowski. I'm the great-grandson of General Sosabowski and the grandson of Dr. Major Sosabowski, also a hero of the Polish Republic, for reasons I'm about to tell you. I'm so, so delighted to be here to give their story. Their story isn't often heard, um, and it's time that it is, and it's my pleasure to go around giving it to Poles in general, but young Poles in particular, because I think it's really important that they carry this message forward um, as we have been doing all right, uh, that's very nice. Uh, we are really happy that you are here with us. And what would you like to pass to, to our young students and pupils? The realities of how lucky we are to be here. I know it's all about iPhone 12 and TikTok and Facebook and Instagram, but the reality is 75, 80 years ago, Europe was hell. People were literally eating rats from the sewers and they were fighting for our freedom. And Poles in general, so Europeans in general, but Poles in particular, made this heroic battle to conquer Nazism and we owe them a debt that we can never ever repay. And the one way we can start to repay it symbolically is remember. So on the anniversaries, we need to reflect and think about the sacrifice that was made so that we could be free in modern day Europe. Do you feel any strong connection with Poland? I do. I'm so delighted and somewhat undeserving that I've just been given my Polish citizenship based on the fact that my father was born in Poland, my grandfather and my great grandfather. And I want to engage far more with my Polish roots and my heritage. At the age of 57, I appreciate it's a little bit late, but better late than never. So I really want to connect. And this meeting this morning is um, a perfect example of what I want to be doing. I want to be doing this more. I want to go to the POSC Centre in uh, King Street in Hammersmith and all the consulates and give the lecture. Let the lecture be a running part of Polish, the Polish heritage calendar. Do you feel responsibility for being a part of this famous family? Oh, without a doubt. And let me be absolutely sure, these are not my achievements. I am merely the messenger. I never fired a weapon in anger. I am just a mud run of the mill boring professor. They are the heroes, but it is my duty to ensure, as a member of their family, to carry their story back and teach the young people about it. Thank you, Mr. Sosobowski, for your visit. And we, we're, we are really happy and we look forward to hear your story about your grand-grandfather, about your family, and about Polish soldiers who fought for our freedom. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank, Thank you very much. much. This is my father wearing the black suit. This is my uncle wearing the brown suit. And of course, that's me wearing the white suit. Right, so we're going to go through these at a, at a race of pace because we can't dwell too much on the history. But the reality was that the general was born into hardship, and he was born into um, he was born in Stanislavov, which ironically is in modern day Ukraine. We'll talk more about Ukraine a little bit later on because his son, the major, was born in. Brno, which is in, I think, Czechoslovakia. So actually, Polish though our family is, it's sort of, the, the borders of Poland are so fluid that sometimes it's Poland and sometimes it's not. But anyway, his father died quite young, and that's part of the problem, that he became, at the age of 12, the head of his family. And although they were of good means, which means they had enough money, his dad was working on the railways, which curiously, was quite a high level job in those days. Um, in 1904, his father died. So he had to run the family. He had to get money for the family. And he did this by um, tutoring his school friends um, as they needed tutoring. And it was his duty very much. So he had leadership at an early time of his life. But he also started wanting to be part of a uniform organisation. So the Scouts was the obvious thing. Later on, he started um, an early army career and for reasons which won't interest us right now, he was conscripted to the Austrian army in World War I. And almost straight away, he was injured um, and he damaged his leg. And that's one of the only pictures of the main, of the general, um, sergeant that he was, he looks a bit unsure of himself there. He had a quite severe injury to his um, leg. But his heroism started then. He was, good day to you, how nice to see you. Um, he was fighting in Przemyśl, which ironically is the center of some fighting now in the current war. And he was part of a contingent fighting off a terrible battle 
um, vastly outnumbered by Russians with all sorts of war crimes happening. He was one of, a three, a, a three of a battalion of 250 who survived the First World War. And from that point, things got a little bit better. After the First World War, um, Warsaw became the Paris of the East. And he was a staff lecture, lecturer at the Polish Staff College. He taught soldiers how to soldier. He wrote a couple of books on military strategy. And I quite like this picture. It's a colorized picture of the staff at the Polish Military Academy, and there he is. Now, the interesting thing here that I didn't notice until I'd used this photo several times, is if you look there, and there, and there, those up there are the Vituti Militari, the highest decoration in the Polish army um, that you can get. So they've got no fewer than three in this particular photo. And as it happens, if you're interested, it's the oldest medal that's been continually given for bravery. More than the Victoria Cross, more than the George Cross, the Vituti Militari, the oldest medal in military history. That's just, I just put this here because it's part of history. We don't have to dwell on it. Um, and then we come to 1938, and he is then in charge of the children of Warsaw, and then the Nazis in vain. Now, I need to be all careful about this, because... Um, if I say Germans, German, oh, not all Germans were Nazis, and not all Nazis were Germans. So for our intents and purposes, let's just say they count for the same thing. But it is true, not all Nazis were German, not all Germans were Nazis. And there were some German soldiers who did fight with some code of ethics, right? I'm not saying nice things about German soldiers. It's a very dangerous thing to do when I'm giving this lecture to a Polish audience. But the reality was Warsaw got invaded, and um, the general and his son did two different things. The general commanded the children of Warsaw, and the major went to the underground. The major was his son. He was a military doctor, and he had to divert his resource to being a special operations executive, fighting a nasty war, one with no um, Geneva Convention. And so um, he was captured. Um, he went to whatever that says. You'll know better than me. He went to a prisoner of war camp and just escaped. He escaped and went by a variety of places to Italy, Paris, and went to England via a ship called the Abdepool. And this is where the story starts picking up. The Abdepool was a ship which carried about 4,000, um, sorry, my mistake, 3,000 uh, soldiers, a complete ragtag of escapees from Poland. And the reality was um, they arrived in England and the British didn't know what to do with them. Now, I was born in this country, this country educated me, this country took the general in and the major, so we have some level of gratitude towards it, and um, I speak English, I don't speak Polish, but the reality is the Poles weren't necessarily treated or welcomed as they ought to have been, and in particular by the military machine in the UK. They didn't know what to do with 3,000 Polish. So what they did was they started dividing them up. So, the uh, General Maciek started getting soldiers for the Armour Brigade, uh, General Paszczewicz for the infantry, and Sosobowski got what was left. The criminals, the undernourished, the unwell, but he said, you know what, I'm going to work with these soldiers and I'm going to whip them into shape and make some sort of fighting force. So he had to make an army out of almost nothing. So what they did, they sent the Poles to Scotland and they said, here are some crayons and here are some colouring books. Why don't you colour in those pictures? They weren't treating them seriously at all. But General Sosobowski, not that he was a general then, decided differently. So they said, OK, you go and look after Scotland and don't get into any trouble. And so Sosobowski started to um, lick the army into shape, lick the battalion into shape, and um, he called it, it was called the Canadian Rifle Brigade. For some reason that's lost in the dim mists of time, they thought lots of Canadians could come, but it's not that interesting. Anyway, and they started uh, trying to create the Chiho Chievni. Now, I don't, I don't know any Polish, but I do know that Chiho means be quiet. So that is the silent and unseen. The, the folks that would parachute into Warsaw at risk of certain death and uh, perform covert oper operations. And so there we go, Colonel Sosobowski alighted on the idea of parachuting in. So you drop into the enemy, you surprise them from above, and they weren't paras. He just thought about it, said, right, I've decided we're going to be a parachute brigade, 
and they started arranging parachute courses at the Parachute Training School in Manchester, and the, the parachute tower, which is something that they invented, started being used. And you know now that the Gappa, which is this, um, is the symbol of the brigade. The Gappa is the eagle that drops onto the enemy and surprises them. Um, there was, as it happens, two Poles that did a lot of research into this, and I'm just going to go through these pictures. It's just pictures of soldiers going from being guys in the street to um, being a worthwhile um, type of uh, fighting force. And you can kind of see, they, they're young, they're, a lot of them are undernourished, and um, some of them are sick, but he did what he could. And already, this is 1942, already they're turning into something worth having. This is called the Monkey Grove. They had no resources. The British didn't give them anything. They gave them some old uniforms, some old weapons. The stuff the British didn't want, they gave to the Poles. And so they had this building, and they got the carpenters to make an assault course to deal with any fear of heights. So it was Polish ingenuity. The Poles made, um, the, the, literally, the Poles made the brigade, although later on the British would take full credit for it. Once again, this is quite a rare picture of an early parade. Um, but being a parachutist is one thing. You parachute to where you've got to get to. But then when you arrive, you have to know what to do. So you have to be able to ski if it's snowy. You have to be able to survive if it's got no food. And you have to be able to fight. So there was a ski, a ski course uh, provided by Norwegians. There was uh, a mountain climbing course with trainers from the Tatry Mountains. So not only must you parachute in, you have to be able to deal with your environment once you've parachuted in. This is the survival course where you have to literally get thrown into the forest and they say, come back in two weeks and um, find what you need to eat from the forest. Um, once more, the monkey grove, just little pieces of uh, improvised equipment used to train yourself to be a para. And here we have the parachute tower. This is a Polish invention, although the British claim it's theirs. It's not, it's Polish. The Poles invented the tower and this gives you the opportunity to have a realistic, oscillation-free jump within about 10 minutes and then you go and have another one, rather than having to go into an aircraft and keep jumping. Uh, that's what happens at the bottom. You fall over, you learn to fall properly, you learn to control your parachute. And I like this picture. This is one of my favourite pictures. This is the front of Largo House. Because look at his face, look at this one. You're seeing the patriotic pride of young Poles. Poles like you, they ain't a lot older than you. And they had their capital city, Warsaw, invaded by Nazi invaders. All they want to do is go back and liberate Poland. And suddenly, uh, rather than being just on the street with nothing to eat and no purpose, they've got a uniform, they've got the um, original there, and they've got a chance of going back to liberate Poland. And all along, they were told, do this, and you'll be sent to Poland to liberate Warsaw. That's Largo House now. It's a real pity. It's a lovely building, but it's going to be falling down pretty soon. This is Sosabowski and Browning. These are the fellows training. And this is also one of my favourite pictures. This is Sosabowski with the free French, but look at his face. My great-grandfather was a very difficult man to get on with. He always wanted to pick fights. His son, the Major, was a very difficult man. He always wanted to pick fights. My father, a very difficult man, and you'll not be surprised to know, he always wanted to pick fights. And guess what? I'm a very difficult man, and I always wanted to pick fights, all right? You've got a problem, I'll see you outside after. All right? But the reality is, that's part of his character. But he was a soldier's general. He loved his boys, and they were viciously loyal to him. And he managed to get that sort of pride in uh, Poland and pride in the brigade. Um, they were training French. They started training others using this um, equipment they had. That's Ch Corporal Jankowski, looking very proud of himself. Um, that's the top of the, um, sorry, that's the top of the parachute tower. I have to say, you have to pay me a lot of money to make me jump off that, but there we go. And um, they're just there, generally training with bits of equipment. They're training even um, RAF people with um, parachuting. Okay, so there we go. Now, this is interesting. This here looks like it's just been made out of bits of wood, and it is. What that does is that emulates the exit door of the Whitney bomber. Because the British, again, didn't give the Poles the nice 
Dakota bombers that everyone else, or the Dakotas like everyone else had, where you jump out the side. They gave them the Whitley bombers, and Whitley bombers were really slow, useless aircraft. The only reason they gave them to the Poles is because they didn't want them. In fact, they were so slow that if the Germans saw them coming, they could go away, have their dinner, have a cigarette afterwards, come back, and they could still shoot them down because they're so slow. But the big thing was you had to jump out of the bottom of the aircraft. And the hole wasn't much wider than you were. And they used to do a thing called ringing the bell. Ringing the bell was when you catch your jaw on the way out. And you weren't a proper para unless you'd rung the bell and lost a few teeth. And they used this piece of equipment to emulate that. And the um, Polish jump methods involved lots of lots of innovations. They trained Dutch, British, Norwegians and French. And so they became the leading authority on parachute jumping. Now, I'm not going to go through this. This is very, very technical. But this is what I'm talking about. This is the exit route to a Whitley bomber. And you can just imagine catching your jaw on the way out and um, either breaking your jaw or losing a few teeth. They did quite a lot of jumping from captive balloons as well. A balloon is quite a convenient thing to do because you bring the balloon down, you go up in the balloon, jump, and you can do the whole thing again. And it's much less expensive than jumping from um, aircraft. That's the Whitley bomber. It's not very big. You can see how cramped it is inside, and it really isn't particularly practical for um, actual. Uh, it's, it's a good training. It's a training aircraft. It's always really good for. This is Jersey Dirda. He is the adjutant to the general. He's there. He's there and there. He went back to Poland after the war, and he was put in prison for eight years. And this was the thing, after the Yalta conference, when Poland was effectively annexed to Russia, the soldiers that had fought for the Allies were deemed criminals. And had my great-grandfather gone back to Poland, he would have been executed. You were either in prison for a long time, or you were executed. Um, my great-grandfather made the decision not to go back to Poland until he died, of course, and then he could go back to Poland because dead men can't speak. But Dierda did go back and um, he was in prison for eight years. I don't even know what he was in prison for. Anyway, there's a little movie here. Now, this is what makes the lecture a bit longer, but it's A in Polish, B it's original, and the decision's been made that we're going to play the movie. So sit back and watch some of the detail for what happened. Niemcy hitlerowskie się załamały, to wtedy generał Sikorski mógłby się dostać w ciągu 6 godzin do Polski, ale zanim jakieś wojsko jego, jakaś dywizja przeszła do kraju, to wtedy trwałoby to na pewno 6 tygodni. Zapadło moje postanowienie. Pójdziemy do kraju jako kadra pierwszej polskiej brygady spadochronowej. Sprzymierzeni dostarczą nam broni i zaopatrzenia materiałowego. Brygada i kraj najkrótszą drogą to nasze przeznaczenie. Jakim materiałem ludzkim rozporządzałem? 80% oficerów wszystkich rodzajów broni i służb. Rozpiętość wieku od lat 20 do 50. Stopnia od podporucznika do pułkownika. A wytrzymałość fizyczna? Trudno było wymagać na przykład od pułkowników, którzy byli już po 40, aby ich stan fizyczny odpowiadał warunkom skoku ze spadochronem. Oczywiście mieliśmy sporą ilość wysportowanych oficerów i podchorążych. Trzeba było zorganizować w brygadzie specjalny ośrodek wstępnego szkolenia spadochronowego, który nosił później nazwę Małpiego Gaju. Zainstalowany sprzęt sportowy, jak równoważnie kozły, liny do wspinania oraz cały zespół rozmaitych przyrządów i urządzeń do pokonywania przeszkód w terenie skonstruowaliśmy sami. Na drzewach w parku porozwieszano różne rodzaje trapezów. W stajni nasi oficerowie saperzy wykonali w suficie otwór imitujący dziurę wyskokową z samolotu. Z tego otworu na rozsypany na podłodze piasek trzeba było skakać z pozycji siedzącej, tak jak przepisowo skacze się z samolotu. Później powstała polska sekcja wyszkolenia spadochronowego w brytyjskim ośrodku Ringway, przez którą w latach 1941-1945 przeszło ponad 5 tysięcy żołnierzy polskich i alianckich. We wrześniu 1941 roku odbyły się ćwiczenia. Spadochroniarze lądowali bez wypadku i wykonali swoje zadania bojowe. Zarówno generał Sikorski, jak i jego otoczenie polskie i brytyjskie byli zadowoleni z wyniku ćwiczeń. Generał wręczył osobiście zebranym skoczkom znaki spadochronowe. Right, so that's what they were doing. Now, when I was watching this movie a few times, I watched it over, then I noticed something. They did all the training 
And then I saw that, and maybe the sharper eyed amongst you have noticed that that up there is a general. And he would never ever get his soldiers to do something that he wasn't prepared to do himself. So they had to have a little bit of a punch up uh, in the field, and that's exactly what they did. And so it went on. Now the whole thing was, they were just constantly in Scotland, constantly training, and constantly being told they could go uh, liberate Warsaw. But it didn't really happen. So General Sikorsky would visit. Um, they developed the notion of the GAPA um, to uh, sort of reinforce this. And I think we have another little video clip right here. <laughs> detail that we can sort of focus on is that um, the GAPA became a thing, the symbol of the brigade, and there's not just one kind, there's several kinds. This, for example, is the Home Army GAPA, and um, the wreath was given to you when you've done at least one jump, and then sometimes they put the number of jumps that you um, had. So, he used to keep his soldiers training at all times because they get bored, and um, Around this time, the Khitan massacre happens, and it's once again developing the brigade by having specialisations like signals, engineers, and so forth. And all along, they're going to liberate Poland, and that's what's important. They've got the, uh, artillery, their trains, and this is 1942, so um, 1943. They really are developing to the point they want to get to. And again, curiously, they start working with the first airborne of the British, to whom they'd be seconded in due course, because that's what happened at the one and only battle they went into. They got some new colours, and I'm going to introduce you to this guy. This is Frederick Browning, and English people quite like him, Polish people don't, because he said some disgraceful things about the Poles at Arnhem, he said they didn't fight bravely, they said they were cowards, and he had General Sosabowski removed from his command. And Sosabowski and him didn't like each other at all. This guy, he's like the typical English officer class. Anyone who isn't English is a foreigner, and Poles in particular were way down his list of people that he would talk to on an equal basis. So there just wasn't any friendliness between them. He just didn't respect Poles in general and my great-grandfather in particular. And you can sort of see what he's thinking. I mean, I'd love to have some captions there. There's this obvious dislike and um, the general's thinking, mate, you know what? <laughs> With a, uh, ten, ten of your soldiers are better than one of our, ten of my soldiers are better than a thousand of yours. We'll move on a bit and um, we'll take a break in about 10 minutes. There's 3,000, 2,000 soldiers in the brigade. 
and they are um, making an office class, a cadet school. So all in all, they're ready. They're ready to go back to um, Poland. And they had even this American guy, he just joined the brigade because he liked the brigade. He was, said, I want to join you because I like what you're doing. I want to go and help liberate Poland. And they had lots of visitors, but the reality was they wanted to fight. Now, the interesting thing, again, with this particular um, picture, I use this picture, I've been doing this lecture for about 20 years. I've used this picture and I use it and it hides in plain sight. And then one time I noticed this. This is a Vituti military too. Like I said, the highest decoration you can get. And it transpires that the general got his decoration in the First World War. So he was already a war hero for his um, uh, defence in the 21st uh, uh, The Children of Warsaw. Let's not dwell on that, but he got his heroism for um, what he did at the beginning of World War II. Let's move on. So they have these little scooters. They remind me of those little scooters you see kids driving on the roads with now, uh, without any insurance or tax, I hate as well. Um, and those were designed so that when you parachute somewhere, you can uh, scooter to where you need to be. If the drop zone is a mile away from where your action is, you need to get there fast. Because as you can see, that the um, uh, parachute, the whole, the whole advantage of using parachutes is surprise. This is interesting. This is the uh, new standard. It was parachuted uh, by the three Chiha Chiemni, and it is the robes of Cardinal Donieski, which is again quite sweet. That's the um, Polish president. We'll talk more about him later on. And um, yeah, there's more and more pictures of how the brigade was developing. They moved to Stamford, which is in Peterborough, because they've gone for operational training, and pretty soon they're going to be used in some sort of attack on Eastern, on Western Europe. They were subordinated to the first airborne. Um, they went to um, Peterborough. There was a bit of an accident there. They lost 26 poles due to a crash, and um, the brigade drops into uh, drill on day five of Operation Market Guard. We're going to come back to that in a little while. After the war, the brigade was seconded to the British Army of the Rhine, um, and after a while, it was disbanded, um, but it's not forgotten. And in a minute, we're going to take a break. But interestingly, I'm going there next week. I'm going to, but this is in Belfast. I didn't realise there's a whole Polish community in Belfast, and um, I'm doing three lectures next week. And they put uh, this beautiful mural on the side of one of the houses. So I shall go and inspect that. And um, I'll be taking this story from my email account, all right? So pay the, let's pay the debt back to our ancestors by listening to it. Now, Operation Market Garden, maybe you haven't even heard of it. It was one of the most decisive, should have been battles in the Second World War, but it's where, um, as enthusiasts for Polish heritage, we need to pay our attention. Now, the thing about it is it's one of the most expensive films at the time in history. And if you can look, you see Dirk Bogart, James Carr, Michael Caine, Sean Connery, Edward Fox, Gene Hackman, uh, can't remember, uh, Den Helmelia. Um, him, the Silence of the Lambs guy. Hopkins. Yeah, Anthony Hopkins, thank you. All right. And him, a famous classic thespian actor, can't remember. Um, anyway, look, it's a really expensive cast, all right? Now, two of my favourites, well, my big favourite, of course, is Gene Hackman, who played General Sosabowski, and, but also, I like this guy. His name is Hardy Kruger. He's actually Swiss. He always plays the kind of hot-headed SS captain who wants to blow everything up. Um, and he is an amalgamation of four or five characters from the actual history. And I also like Maximilian Schell, because he's always the more level-headed commanding officer who says to him, please stop blowing up my bridges. Now, the interesting thing for me is that's the general, and that's Gene Hatton. Gene Hatton, he's still alive, 91 now. Really, really famous actor, you know, the French Connection and all the rest of it. And he really, there's a lot of criticism of his portrayal of General Sosabowski, because he, he portrays him as a kind of argumentative, quite rude, quite direct. He got it 100% right. That's what he was. He didn't suffer fools gladly. And they even sent researchers to his son, the major, and said, tell us about some of your father's mannerisms. And there's two brilliant um, scenes, one with Jeremy Kemp, 
when he's explaining, um, he's explaining what's going on, and the, uh, Gene Hackman walks up and says, just checking whose side you are on. He, maybe he said that, but it's the kind of thing he would have said. And there's that other lovely scene with Ben Homelia when he's getting cross about the fog. It was really 100%, but I think this is uncanny. He even looks like him. And look at the accurate way they've got the dressing. This is the Polish method of wearing a beret. More, normally, a beret is pulled down to the side with the badge over your left eye. You look at the paras, that's how they have it. But the poles have them pulled to the back, and they even got that right. They lot really took some attention to detail. If this lecture does anything for you, all right, just go onto Amazon. You can buy the DVD of a British Too Far for maybe three pence plus shipping for a used version. And on that DVD, there's a special feature, and that special feature is called the trivia track. And a lot of my detail I got from this trivia track. It comes up with little bubbles which tell you when they made a small change for poetic license because they had to condense five days into three hours. And it's these little things. And it's a really, really interesting thing of the sort of slight inaccuracies or the changes they made to make the film. Also, maybe you'd like... James Cameron had a, there's a, film, a quadrilogy of films called The Aliens. Uh, Geiger's Xenomorphs. You either know it or you don't. It's Alien, Aliens, Alien Covenants, Prometheus, and Alien Resurrection. Does anyone know that genre of films? <gasps> Be still my beating heart. It's my favourite. <laughs> Absolute favourite. And the thing was, if you look at... These are the Colonial Marines. And if you look at their names, no fewer than three of them are named after people who took part in Market Garden. There's Hicks, of course, the, the British leader. There's Frost, Colonel John Frost, and interestingly, Weir's Bosky. And it's because James Cameron, when he was writing the screenplay, was also reading A Bridge Too Far at the same time. I'm all for it, except James, Jim, if I may, if you wanted a Bosky, there's a much more obvious candidate, Sosa Bosky, please. But um, Weir's Bosky was in, I think he was um, in the 101st, as it happens. Edmund Weir's Bosky. I don't want to do too much about um, the military, because that really is going to make you as bored as bored can be. But we get to the stage in the war when the Germans, good day to you, and what a pleasure, how nice to see you, Your Worship. Um, when um, the uh, Allies are, retreat are advancing, but they're not as advanced, advancing as far as the Germans slash Nazis are retreating. Literally, the Germans are retreating faster than the Allies can advance. Now that sounds like the idyllic situation to be in, except it's not. Because if you haven't got the logistics and the supply, you run out of road really quickly. So literally, the Germans are losing 200,000 killed or wounded, 2,000 POWs, 25 out of 38 divisions are obliterated. And on Mad Tuesday, Donny Dinsdag, um, they were really trying to catch the Germans, they were running that fast. However, this um, creates its own supply problems. And part of the supply problems is Holland is a strange country in terms of how you get stuff to it. Allow me to explain further. <coughs> there were two big actors here, okay? Um, Patton and Montgomery, and they disliked each other intensely. And Eisenhower had to resource one or the other. The, if you read von Clausewitz on the war, you send your resources to the, the, the general with the likeliest chance of success. You don't spread it thin. Um, so he had to choose which of those. And one of them had uh, the resources and one didn't. And this is one of the ironies which caused Market Garden to fail. Montgomery, Monty, he believed in one big thrust towards Berlin. You punch through the Germans, go down towards Berlin, take the industrial heart of the Ruhr, and you've won the war by Christmas. However, um, Eisenhower said, oh no, a broader approach. Let's just do it on all, all fronts. Now, as it happens, he um, chose Montgomery. And the irony was the Germans thought he would choose Eisenhower. And so guess what? They sent the 9th and the 10th SS Panzers to rest and refit in a little Dutch town called Arnhem. We'll be hearing a lot about that later on. Okay? These are the German key commanders. Now, I don't, I always get uneasy about saying nice things about German soldiers in general, 
but to a Polish audience, that's near suicide. But nevertheless, these were the German soldiers in the field, and the thing about it is, a lot of these were Wehrmacht soldiers, with the exception of Beatrix, who was SS, and the Wehrmacht, which, are you there ladies? It's all that happening up here. A lot of the Wehrmacht, they were soldiers. They'd been to military college, they held the doctrines of the Geneva Convention close to their hearts, and whilst there was, we all know about the atrocities and the war crimes and so forth, um, normally, um, especially at Arnhem, things were fought according to the normal rules of engagement. I'm not making any apology for any of the things that weren't, but I do want to point out that um, some of these were soldiers, soldiers, and some of them, in fact, were almost executed for being so. For example, von Rundstedt uh, said to Hitler's chief of staff, Kiefel, end the war, we're going to lose. Why sacrifice more life? And he was removed from post only 18 days um, to be replaced later on. So this is the German hierarchy, and we're going to be interested in him, him, him and him, with a little bit of him. Von Rundstedt was the overarching chap. So this is the situation. Um, we've got the Allies in Western Europe, we've got the uh, Germans also in Western Europe, and this is the bit of in that we're interested in. This is where um, the ports are, Antwerp. And if you hold this, you hold all the supply lines into Holland. And the problem was that the Allies didn't think it through. They didn't hold the waterways to allow access to Antwerp. And so we couldn't resupply. Moreover, Ron von Rundstedt believed that um, Eisenhower backed Patton and not Montgomery, and this is key. They sent two um, divisions of tanks to Arnhem, the little village, a town, if you will, that the Allies were going to attack. They were going to attack the parachutists and they were going to find two divisions of tanks there. That was the problem. Moreover, this is a close-up of the Svelder. Um, these chaps, von Zangen's 15, were allowed to escape and the Allies didn't control this waterway. So Rotterdam's down here, the Allies controlled this, but they couldn't get to it because they couldn't control the water. If they'd managed to control that, they would have had a supply line and nothing would have gone wrong. I'm just going to push on to um, the key, the key um, aspects. So Operation Market Garden was twofold. Market was to drop 35,000 soldiers by parachute and glider to capture seven bridges in Holland and keep those bridges for two days. And if they kept those bridges for two days, that would allow 30 corps, which is a load of tanks, to drive up a single road, get to Arnhem at the top, and turn right into the heartland of Germany. And as soon as you captured the industrial Ruhr, the war's over. You can already imagine this. So seven bridges with parachutists on one road. I'm sure you can already see how things could go wrong. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Lots and lots of things could go wrong. Right, so let's look at the players. So the British Airborne, the US 101st, uh, the US 82nd, and 30 Corps with the tanks. Now this is where the poles are, all right? They were kind of assimilated by the first Airborne. They had their own identity, and we will be concentrating on what they did. So three drops of paras um, on all these bridges, and as the tanks here drove up this road, um, each of these would pass them on to the next. So you had to keep the road clear, you had to keep the bridges intact. And at some point, the Germans would realise this and start blowing up the bridges. And if you blow up the bridges, the tanks can't cross, it's all over. The thing was, there was no margin for error. Now, everyone knows that whatever you do, you've got to have levels of redundancy. If this goes wrong, how do we manage anyway? If that goes wrong, how? this didn't have any of that. So, um, the first airborne would capture Arnhem, and Arnhem literally is at a crossroad. You go to Arnhem, you turn right, and suddenly you're in Germany. And that's what happened. Now, these were the Brits. Okay, so Brereton, Browning, Roy Urquhart, uh, Gavin, Maxwell Taylor, and Sosabowski. And already you can kind of see um, American, English, English, American, American, Polish. You can see straight away that the Pole, the foreigner, 
and that was a, a, um, a feature, a thing that would crop up from time to time um, more and more and more. There we are again. Uh, these were, this is how the um, chain of command happened. This was the uh, first airborne, so Roy Urquhart, uh, jolly nice chap, um, with these are his um, underneath, Hicks, Hackett, Lathbury and Sosnowski. Again, one quarter Polish and the rest is English. So they started um, flying two and a half thousand gliders, 35,000 men, um, and they did it at one week's notice. Can you imagine um, devising an operation with 35,000 men, two and a half thousand gliders in a week? I can't get my lectures next week sorted out. I can if I'm lucky. And they did this, all right? So it was pulled together at weeks next. And as soon as you pull things together at short notice, the gaps haven't been identified, the bugs haven't been ironed out, and it hasn't gone through its beta testing. So, two thirds paras, one third gliders, and the key thing is parachutists. Parachutists are normally men, exclusive men then. They carry about 150 rounds of ammunition, plus that which they, their, their supplies, what they can eat, and they literally, unless they're resupplied, they are on their own for a short amount of time. They can't survive for anything. That, if they land on top of tanks, it's all over. They weren't expecting tanks. And there was a young chap called Brian Urquhart, not Roy Urquhart, Brian Urquhart. He did some, he was an intelligence officer, and he did some intelligence. And he found signs that there were tanks. And the Dutch underground sent pictures of tanks. And this was brought to Brownie's attention. And he said, oh no, they're probably not usable, or they're probably dummy tanks, or they've made a mistake. But the reality was, the whole of the 9th and the 10th divisions were resting in Arnhem. And there's one thing that um, parachutists can't deal with, is tanks. So, um, this, there was a perception that the Germans were running out of operational soldiers, and um, this is the key thing. Brian Urquhart, he's not called Urquhart in the film because of Roy Urquhart, he's called Major Fuller, I think. Um, he was literally, he said, what's the matter with you? There are tanks. You're going to, it'll be a massacre. And he was taken off duty. So that's what happened. And they um, had the drop zones about eight miles from the targets. Now, parachutists. The whole point of being a parachutist is you drop onto your target and you surprise them. If you drop eight miles away and they hear the plane, they've got the time it takes you to travel eight miles on foot to prepare. It is not a surprise anymore. And that was another flaw in the plan. So um, there was no miles in Ferreira, some of the equipment was untested and it was at one week's notice. And so it all went terribly, terribly wrong. But the biggest bit of wrongness about it was they landed on all these tanks, okay? A division of tanks is a lot of tanks. And um, there was loads of them. You can see they were all around the place. The 9th, the 10th, the Grenadiers, and so forth. So as soon as that happened, it was all over. There was no way out. And um, the thing about the, the British sense of kind of, let's get on with it and fair play, even when they realized there were tanks, they thought, well, maybe we can deal with it. But they couldn't, in particular because the uh, zones where the, para the resupply, parach the resupply drops were supposed to take had been overrun by the Germans. So the Germans were supplying all the supplies, sorry, the, the RAF was supplying all the supplies to the Germans, not to the British. And so it just went horribly, horribly wrong. Um, when the um, British started landing, Modal assumed he was the target for the attack. And one of his, well, it could be the bridge. Of course he's not the bridge, mate. Well, the bridge is 10 miles away. Why would they do that? He thought it was too stupid for the bridge to be the target, um, but he did move the 10th and the 9th to Arnhem, and to cut a lot of, a long story short, don't even bother reading this, the radios didn't work, um, there was no communication, the supply drops didn't happen, uh, one of the bridges was blown up, and the tanks just, the road was a single, a single lane. And if you've ever been on a traffic jam on the motorway, we all know that a single lane, once it's blocked, that's it, it stopped. There was no way they could do it. And so it's just getting wrong and wrong. So I've got two or three of these little cartoons 
which show where they should have been versus where they were. And we don't have to analyze that in great depth, but the reality is that they just got further and further behind and um, the, uh, off at the soldiers started being killed, um, the bridges were uncaptured, and it all started going horribly wrong. I'm not going to dwell on Julian, um, Julian Cook's battle, but you can see that the tanks just fell further and further behind. It must have been ghastly. We'll skip that particular video because we've got others to look at. Um, there were some rays of sunshine. Um, Harmel tried to blow up one of the bridges, but it didn't work um, because the Dutch underground uh, sabotaged the explosives. But the reality was um, that it just wasn't going to happen. And even uh, when 30 Corps got near the bridge, they had to stop. Um, they stopped in one mile from the bridge, and um, they had to. Uh, John Frost men had to start withdrawing. Um, these are some pictures of modern day Arnhem with all these things. What happened in the end was um, Roy Urquhart's uh, fellows got hemmed in with uh, a craft and all the tanks around them, and they started having to retreat over the, over the Rhine. So it didn't work. It didn't work at all, and at some point there was a massive British withdrawal. And in a few seconds' time, we'll get on to what the Poles did. Um, and this is what I'm talking about um, when I start saying relatively nice things about um, Germans. B Trip was an SS officer, and the SS, they were, above all else, they were the sort of most hated and um, guilty of most of the war crimes. But occasionally they showed some humanity. And for example, he allowed a ceasefire so some of the wounded could be collected and buried out. And I think, ironically, he gave a bottle of brandy to be given to John Frost. And um, these are the reasons. Now, maybe some of you are going to turn into um, military historians. And there's, if you want to start a fight at a military history society, just start talking about why Operation Market Garden failed. Because um, everyone's got their own view. But these bullet points just talked about some of the reasons. Let's not dwell on those. Let's look at the pictures of Polish Paris. Because the Poles went in, and the Poles fought, and the Poles... Um, saved lives and the Poles were blamed for the Zali, having shown you those 10 bullet points, the Poles were blamed for the failure of the operation. And I'll tell you more about it in the really sad bit before the really happy bit later on. The Poles were due to take off, I think, day two or day three, but there was a lot of fog and um, they couldn't take, the planes couldn't take off. That up there is the general. He was 52 and I'm 57, so he was five years younger than I am. That's his pack there, and they're at RAF Saltby about to take off. And I put these details here, don't even bother reading them. It's important for the collection of history, because a really jolly nice chap called Mark Vlahos, he found some rare photos. That up there is Chalk 100. That's the actual plane that carried the general. I'm so delighted to have that in my collection. It was um, S52, and um, the general's probably already on. And I'm really, really delighted. So um, that's a bit, and look at that. That's um, Major Faulkner. He was the pilot. And I didn't have that photo until about a year ago. And I think it's just part, it's putting the whole story together. Um, this is the crew, and again, they were, those names won't mean anything to you whatsoever, but I want to have that slide there, because they flew that chalk in, and they flew my great-grandfather into Arnhem. Um, and that's just some more, yeah, you can't probably see that. That's the manifest, and that says Sosabowski, um, so that's the paperwork. So off they went to Arnhem. That was um, allegedly the picture of General John Pigott. I have my doubts, but it could have been, I suppose. And in the film, it says, God bless Field Marshal Montgomery. He didn't say that, and I won't tell you what he did say. I'll tell the adults after. Right, okay. Um, so the poles were due to um, parachute into drop zone K. That got overrun by Germans. And so they got, some of their equipment was parachuted north and some went south. So let me get this straight. Uh, the, the chap landed in Drill and there, there's some really high hills. So they were landing on some fields above which there were some fields with German machine guns. That's called the Westerbowing Heights. Now you can't, 
Cameras always foreshorten things. So the poles landed here, the river's wet, you can't quite see it, and they've got German machine guns there. So literally, they were being raked by machine guns as they landed. And um, that's the view going the other way. So it's like a turkey shoot, literally, they were being shot. And so they had to wait till dark. And what happens at dark, they were told to cross the river. They were, how do we cross the river? There was supposed to have been a ferry boat. The ferry boat wasn't there. So they were given rubber boats. Now, as it happens, in the film, if you've seen the film, that's Gene Hackman, there's a chap comes in and um, he talks with an English accent. He goes, General, all right, Governor, General Urquhart sent me, Lordy Lord, stone the crows, I'm a cockney sparrow. And that really upsets me because it wasn't an Englishman who did that. He, an Englishman didn't swim the Rhine, it was a pole. It was um, caught, uh, Captain Pimp. Captain Wolanski, he was the um, liaison officer with the first airborne. Look at him dashing there with his cigarette. He was swimming the Rhine in the freezing cold. And I just don't know why they had to have some British guy playing this. And my great grandfather said, Tell your general we're coming. We're coming tonight. Which is quite a sort of heroic thing to say. So they started crossing on rubber boats. There was a um, piece of rope across it, and they pulled gently pulled across with these rubber boats, and then the Germans sent up a, a magnesium flare, a very light, it lit them all up, and the machine gun started. And Gene Hackman shouts, sure, sure. And my granny got so upset, because in Polish, doesn't sure mean string? Yeah, well it does, that's what she said. And he meant rope, not string, you don't pull ropes, rope, anyway. The fact was, they, they were just being shot in the water in rubber boats. And so they tried two crossings and some of them got cross. But the reality was, it wasn't gonna happen. Um, there was not much they could do. These are just miscellaneous pictures. There's nothing particularly special about them to show the poles were right there doing what they were supposed to have been doing. And we'll see later on what was said about them. Um, <laughs> slurs and lies which haven't been, well they have been corrected by the Dutch, they have been by the Poles, but they haven't been by the British. And this is not about being anti-British, with British I am, but it is an injustice that needs to be corrected. At some point um, there was a withdrawal, there was a thing called the Valberg Conference whereby the Poles were seconded to the Dorsets and they were there to cover the retreat and with stunning irony if you recall that the Poles were accused of being cowardly, the Poles were the last act. The Poles covered the retreat of the British. That's the cowardice that um, was to be written about them. So, um, he just said, stop, stop losing lives. And they went to the, the um, Dorsets and they had to protect the British withdrawal. So 500 Poles um, lost and 98 killed. Um, the Polish sacrifice was real, and the brigade returned to England, it went to Stamford, and it was seconded to the British Army of the Rhine. He was a character. I mean, we're all characters. He was not a cookie-cutter general. He had his own character, and he was, at the very least, eccentric, which we all are. There's a story about him getting on a bicycle to get a, to get a tank to follow him to deal with some troublesome... Uh, soldiers, uh, Germans. I put this picture here because I find it quite haunting. This is um, the padre of the brigade, uh, Humbert Misuda. I just think it's, you know, he's a young boy, he's maybe 23, just a haunting face. He was killed and his body was only found about 30 years ago in um, one of the dikes. I show you the war cemetery now because this is where the story gets a bit happier. As you can see, the Dutch are very proud of how they keep the war cemetery. And there was a big debt of gratitude to the soldiers in general, but not the Poles in particular. I'll talk more about that um, in due course. Um, it's see how well kept it is. And I'll come back to that when I talk about the film that was made. So let's talk about the general a little bit. And we'll start with this piece of um, documentation. This is a letter written by um, Ronald Weeks. Oh, sorry, two Ronald Weeks from General Browning, and it basically says General Sosabowski was argumentative, unsuited to the purpose he was seeing, and 
just ripped, completely and utterly trashed his, um, his character. And uh, President Rashkevich acted on that. And don't forget, the, Poles were, the Polish government in exile was very much beholden to the British. And so he was quite pressurised that. That's why the Polish RAF couldn't march in the commemorations. We really were the, um, yeah, the foreigners. Don't let the Poles come because they're not important. And so he was offered uh, inspector of uh, disposal and salvage, and he said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit. So he quit, and he told his boys. He said, I'm going, but I'm not going to kiss the colours. Kissing the colours of what a leaving general would do. He said, I'll be back. And they went on a hunger strike. He said, no, no, boys, let's have dinner together, um, and then I'll go um, uh, on my own terms. And so this is what happened. This is his, uh, his CV. We've already talked about most of this. But what happened to him after the war was really disgraceful. And as young Poles, I think you should be rightly angry about how not only he, but General Maciek was treated. General Maciek ended up being a barman in a restaurant in Edinburgh. Now, someone's got to be a barman, but I'm not sure that a two-star general needs to be a barman because they didn't give him a war pension. And of course, he couldn't go back to um, uh, Poland. I think eventually the Dutch gave him a, a war pension. Um, but the reality was that General Sosabowski didn't get one. And he, um, he started, I think, to start, start some businesses. They didn't quite work out. Um, he lived in Hillingdon, or no, Harlesden. Harlesden, he, not Hill, Harlesden he lived in, which is this Acton way. Um, I think his house has got a blue plaque on it. Um, and he tried to live his life as best he could. He didn't get bitter. He didn't get angry about things. He just got on with it as best he could. Um, and later on, we'll see that he, um, he was sanguine. I think sanguine is such a good word. It comes from the Latin word sanguina for blood. It means at peace with oneself. He didn't spend his life thinking how unfair everything was. So he left with £300 in savings. Now, £300 then was probably a bit more than it's worth now, but I don't know, even if it was 10 times more, three grand. Three grand at age 57. He went to um, a place in Acton and he was a storeman, Stan the storeman. And every time he drove past the operatives in his forklift truck, they would snap to attention because a lot of the operatives were his soldiers. And he started writing. Now, you know better than I what that means, the shortest way, um, the way round by the He wrote his books and he retired at age 75 and he was obstinate to the last, but he wouldn't take his heart medication, so he died of a heart attack when I was two. Um, of course, then he could go back to Poland, and he's buried in our family grave. Um, he's buried in our family grave uh, with his son and his son's wife. I think this is a video, and I'm hoping it is. If it is, oh, it's not. There we go, we'll have a video in a minute. So this is sort of a 1960s type things that are going on, and he's, he is, he's a celebrity in West London, because there's a big Polish community, um, and although he's a storeman, he's, he's, the, he's the top dog, he's number one. Był i pozostał do końca swego życia żołnierzem w służbie Rzeczypospolitej. Generał Zusabowski po wojnie prowadził ożywioną działalność na emigracji. Pisze, by przekazać prawdę przyszłym pokoleniom. Jest moim obowiązkiem wyliczyć się przed narodem z każdej kropli krwi żołnierskiej. Jako dowódca byłem tylko wykonawcą woli narodu i jego sługą. Generał zespala swych byłych podkomendnych i organizuje Związek Polskich Spadochroniarzy. Bierze udział w uroczystościach odsłonięcia pomnika bohaterów spod Arkem. Spotyka się z kombatantami i ich rodzinami, starając się im pomóc. Jest niestrudzony. Generał zaraz po wojnie sprowadził z Polski swojego syna Stanisława, lekarza, Oficera Armii Krajowej, który w czasie Powstania Warszawskiego został ciężko ranny i stracił wzrok. Syn generała wspomina. W 1945 roku zostałem ewakuowany do Paryża dzięki staraniom mojego ojca i tu się spotkałem z ojcem po latach pięciu. Było to raczej bardzo wzruszające spotkanie, bo ojciec starał się panować. I showed you that because at the end, that was the major. 
the son of the general. And if you looked at his face and thought his face was a bit funny, it was, because he got shot in the face on day four of the Warsaw Uprising. And I want to talk about him um, now, because he's not talked about often enough. And he was a modest man. He kept quiet about his own achievements and spoke about the achievements of his father. Um, but he was a hero, and he was a different kind of hero because the general fought a war with the Geneva Convention hovering in the background. The Major did not. The Major was an operations executive with the AK, the Army Krakowia, and that meant it was, there were no rules. It, the, the rules were live or die. And he started life as um, a military doctor. You can kind of see he's kitted out that way. He's an absolutely beautiful boy, as you can see. When he was 19, he got cancer and lost one of his eyes. So he had only had one eye anyway. And he also, when he was 16, he jumped into a river and hit a rock and broke his back. So he had his share of um, burdens. Um, that's quite a nice colorized photograph of him. This is him at medical school. And um, he was um, the most self-effacing man you can ever imagine. Now, after my grandmother died, um, I used to go and visit him every two weeks. He lived in Dorset. Like, we, all kind of, we all assumed he'd go and live somewhere else or go and live in St. Dunstan. He said, no, I'm, they'll carry me out wearing my boots. I'm staying here with my cat. And I used to talk to him. And as I developed into an adult, pay attention to that, buddy. This is really important. As I grew into an adult, he started confiding in me. He started saying things he'd never said. He told me about the time when he was driving with his mates and they needed a German uniform and they saw a 19-year-old infantryman and so they kidnapped him and they shot him. They had to kill him for his uniform. And he said, I still think about that boy. Can you imagine? War is not just what happens to you or what you do to others. It's what you carry with you for the rest of your life. He had to kill a 19-year-old boy. He found out that his colleague in the SOE, Yashek, had just betrayed them to the Gestapo. So he said, Yashek, step outside. And Yashek had to kneel down, and he had to execute him too. And he had to live with them. H.G. Wells said, war makes monsters of us all. But it didn't make a monster out of him. He was a lovely, lovely old man. Him and Granny used to sit in their little bungalow in Wimborne. They used to give money to local charities on the strict condition that it was anonymous. And when my grandmother died and I went to see him, he was on the phone. And he was obviously on the phone to the man, the state, talking to some bored, disinterested administrator. And afterwards, I said, who are you talking to? He said, the pensions agency. I want to make sure that we don't claim Granny's pension anymore because that wouldn't be right. She died the day before, and that's what was worrying him. That's the sort of person he was. This is him, um, a little bit about him. He was the commander of Collegium A of the Warsaw District. And Collegium A, they were literally liquidating German assets, and um, he received a, gu a gunshot to the face on day four, and he was taken to St. Lazar Hospital. It was their bad fortune that the SS brigade that was in Warsaw was the Derlewanger Brigade, the most atrocious, barbaric, brutal brigade uh, led by Oscar Derlewanger. In fact, they were so barbaric that the SS didn't want them in the SS anymore. I cannot tell you what they did because you are still of tender years, but um, it was beyond, it was a penal regiment. The, the soldiers weren't expected to live, and you could either be executed or be part of the Derlewang Brigade. So, um, and he was, he was hanged as a war criminal for some of the things he'd done. Um, 35,000 fighters, um, and they wanted the help from the brigade, but the help just didn't come. You'll notice, the sharp right amongst you, that those are SS uniforms. They used to steal uniforms from the Germans to wear. I'd like to, we were trying to find if he was there. That might be him, I suppose. Could be, probably isn't, but um, I can fantasize about it. And just a quick word, we don't really talk about the AK. It's a different sort of subculture, but these two, for example, I mean, look at the way they're dressed. 
I mean, they were just so, they were, they were so cool with their, look at their trousers and the, and the, they were liquidators. They would, they would literally select a German target and then they would have to go and see the cardinal, the Catholic cardinal, because Poland is a Catholic country and God, uh, life is for God to give and take. And so if you're protecting Warsaw, you, they have to go to the cardinal and say, this is why we want to liquidate this particular German. And the cardinal would sign it off. It was a filthy, filthy war. His, uh, Nakrawa means repair, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Right, okay. They all had noms de guerre, a name of war. My, my grandfather was a stashine, which was, I think, was a little bit unimaginative. Killer or something. Yeah. Stashine. Sounds a bit cute. I don't know what that is. Um, uh, Bartek told me that's, that's a place. I'm a member of a Facebook group which colorizes photos, and I find this one, there's, there's hundreds of them, but I find this one haunting, because this guy is one of the AK. He's come up through the wrong hole in the sewers, and he came up around a load of Germans, and he knows he's gonna be executed that day. And look at the look on his face. And this is the hardship that I allude to you. When I was young, I used to get sick of people saying how lucky you are. You've got enough to eat, you've got somewhere to stay, you're being educated, all right? And this is what they had to put up with. And I keep telling you about my great-grandfather. He was blind and he lived on his own. And um, I used to go and do his shopping for him. And of course, because he's blind, say, right, the tins of soup and vegetables are here. The tins of cat food are here. And you can all guess what happened. I went there next week. He says, I had, to, I had for my lunch the other day something. Um, I think I ate a tin of cat food. I said, oh. Oh, sorry to hear that. I'm trying not to be sort of sick. I said, well, how was it? He said, very good. <laughs> and you know what? It is funny. And then it's not so funny because you think they would eat rats. They were happy if they got a rat to eat. And so for him, it wasn't disgusting. It was just sort of low-grade meat, but it was meat and he ate it. And that's the way he looked at life. If you really are interested, there are several books about the AK. I think they are the understated um, force. Eventually he got back to, he was repatriated back to the UK to be reunited with um, his father and um, he wasn't angry. He wasn't angry about it. He, he lost his first eye when he was 19, his second eye in his 20s and he said, Prof, I was lucky. What do you mean lucky? He got shot in the face. He said I was lucky it was um, an explosive bullet and not an armour piercing bullet because that would have gone through my head. Who on earth says that they were lucky to get shot in the face? Dr. Major S. Sosabowski says it, because he said, you know what, I cheated death three times. I'm not frightened of dying, because I could have died any three times. Now, whatever I've got is extra time. And that's why he's smiling there. And so, his, for reasons that won't interest you, his wife then pushed off, so he brought up his two boys on his own. That's my father. He would get them to school and then get the bus to Hillingdon Hospital where he, was, he continued his career as a doctor. He was stoic. He, he literally, um, he summarised the word stoic. Sanguine, stoic and philosophical. That's him at Hillingdon Hospital. Huh? <laughs> That's me, looking really hot in my little booties and my own. Um, and he was happy. That's him with his second wife, Granny Hanya. They lived in Chiswick um, with Kai Trish the cat. And I never heard him complain about anything. I never heard him moan or say a bad thing about anyone after the hell that he'd been through. Now this makes me laugh, and I'm allowed to. He did archery. Blind archery. Don't you think that's funny? Imagine that's at Rottingdean. Can you imagine all the Rotting Dean residents saying, quick, put the car away, because the blind archers are out. But actually, he was better than me. He'd have this big target, that's his house, he'd have a big target in his garden, and you can imagine that the arrow makes a slightly different noise depending on how near the centre it is. And he could hear that, and then adjust his aim. That piece of kit there was so that he had the height correctly, and there was a big net curtain behind it. He liked playing archery. He just said, you know what? I don't, I don't need my sight, I can listen, I can touch, I can feel, I can smell. He was lucky to be alive. That's the blind archers at Buckingham Palace, and that's my favourite picture of him ever, at all. He just looks happy and content and at peace with himself, despite the hell that he went through. That we can't imagine, 
but I suspect some folks in Kiev, Ukraine can imagine. And that's him and Granny. And I know it's my, it's my family photos, but that's him. And um, he's standing a bit funny because I think he also had um, a spinal injury. Um, but anyway. So um, I think about him a lot. And um, folks often say, oh, I'd give everything I had for one more hour with you. And I, I think, yeah, you know what, I would. I'd give away most of what I have just to spend one more hour. And I wish I'd listened to you more. And I wish I'd spent more time with you. So he was given a uh, full military funeral in Poland, as you can imagine. And that man is a hero. I know his father is better known. He was uh, an absolute hero. This is his list of mem uh, medals. Uh, he was a Polish hero. Absolutely a Polish hero, and um, just maybe not today, but in a week, just think about him, because no one else does. Um, I bullied my father into giving me his medals. I said, give me them, because they were in a yacht, they were in a yacht at party. Can you imagine? So I took them down to Spink and Son, and um, I won't bore you with them now, but that's up there, that's the Vituti Militari, class four, okay? Home Army Medal, there we go. Uh, I think that's the Home Army Medal. This is a hero. But he wouldn't know. He would never talk about it unless you asked him. And even then, because he just said his father, his father, his father. He would have said. Um, Browning said he was difficult to work with, um, unable to uh, appreciate the urgent nature of the operation. Um, and this is what Montgomery said. So you, as Poles, take offence. Take offence, because these are your grandparents. They went there and they bled red to liberate Holland, not Poland, but they went with a good heart anyway. The Poles performed very badly, and the men showed no keenness to fight. It gets worse, boys and girls. Here is the original cipher, so I ain't making it up. The Poles performed very badly here, and the men showed no keenness to fight if it meant risking their own lives. I do not want this brigade here again, and possibly you may like to send it to join the other Poles in Italy. That was the British gratitude, boys and girls. Take offence, you ought to. Because no one never said sorry. The Dutch have, the Poles didn't have to say sorry in the first place. He was always a hero in Poland. Um, shocking, 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 shocking. And then this is just Montgomery saying that Market Garden was a success, even though it didn't work. I'll leave you to talk about that. Now I had to make the font size smaller to fit in all the decorations of the general. Um, this is it, look, all of these things, oh my goodness, um, there's loads and loads of um, scout camps and scouts and schools and roads named after him. This one's interesting because two years ago I went to Warsaw and collected the Order of the White Eagle from President Duda, which was very sweet because Poles don't forget their heroes. Um, the Dutch didn't, the Dutch said thank you, even before the British were being so ugly about it. There's a little street called Sosoboski Plain in Driel, and um, if I go to Driel, I never have to buy a drink. And now, the 6th Airborne Brigade is named after the General, that's their figurehead, and it's a crack Polish brigade. I wouldn't want to mess with them. And they also sweetly named some tulips after him, which I think is very sweet. That's a typically Dutch thing to do. I've got a mate called um, Tomasz Kierkowski who helped me, and I wouldn't want to mess with him, would you? Like, a bit of a scary guy. Um, and these are, this is the current brigade as it is. They are soldiers. They are to be, not to be reckoned with. And um, I just think if Russia starts messing with the Poles, I think it will be a, a slightly different outcome. When the general died, he was taken to the Pawaski Military Cemetery. You see the major there, honouring his father. And um, I'm not going to show you particularly the, the movie, it's just a, a movie of him being buried. Um, that's the Pawaski Cemetery. It's looked after beautifully, so that's the general's other son. That's, um, that's the general. That's the general's wife. Um, that's my grandfather. That's the major. That's my granny. Um, and there's probably a space for me, but I don't need it quite yet. And it's looked after and honoured as quite right it should be. So we'll just sort of finish off by recognising and celebrating him and telling you um, 
a little bit where the situation is now. We've got 10 minutes to go, so well done for sticking to it as long as you can. He was, again, a sanguine man, a practical man. Um, he said, my life was tough and fallow. And the worst thing you can do, of course, is to think, I wish I'd done it differently. He ended up poor, destitute. He had nothing. I don't regret my experience. And if I was told to do it again, I wouldn't hesitate. Which of us can say that? Um, he is a hero of our country. Um, that is a ten zloty coin um, in silver. There's also a two zloty coin. Um, they are sort of collector's items now. I've got a few of them. Um, my, my kids wear one. My boy, a 21-year-old boy and an 18-year-old, they've got it around their neck. Which is very sweet because, of course, they weren't interested. Nah. What's up? Just old men fighting. But the reality is they got quite interested. He's on the stamps, as what he should be. Uh, if you go to Warsaw, his uniform, our family gave his uniform to the, um, so that everyone can enjoy it. That's his gappa, um, which is quite sweet. They've got that. And we'll just reflect a little bit and tell you how we are today. Because in 2003, something happened. And what happened was it started with a silly little conversation in the cemetery. There were some graves at the edge, and someone said to a Dutch journalist, or the, the Dutch journalist said, what are those graves over there? And, oh, don't matter, it's just some poles. What do you mean, just some poles? Aren't they dead like everyone else? Tell me more about that. And so he told the story about the poles um, being subordinated and fighting, and, and he started to do some research. Now this isn't him, this is Eric Van Tilburg. He's a military historian, and he's got an archive. This is Arnie Baltusen. He also um, does a, um, uh, a foundation dedicated to honoring the Poles, but it's this guy, Gertjan Nasher. He wasn't having it. He said, you can't talk about dead soldiers like that. What do you mean, just some Poles? And he started making a TV program. And um, it says that for Hayton Poland in the Slach of Arnhem, the forgotten Polish on the Battle of Arnhem. We're not having it. And Prince Bernhard, the Crown Prince of Holland, saw it, and he said, well, that's not right. They died for our country, and we, we treat them as almost poor criminals. Not having that. And so, um, if you're really interested, I will make sure that Bartek gets this and you can look at the film. Um, because it is a very sort of, the film is very, um, it's very touching. I've put this here. It talks about uh, Cora Baltison, who was tending to the wounded Poles, was looking after a Polish boy who was dying. Was obviously dying. And the last thing he said was, all men are brothers. I, I forgive those who did this, because this is the situation in which we find ourselves. That war means men kill other men, but ultimately all men are brothers. Who says that as they're dying? Um, then, um, Joanna made Honor Generala, and that's in Polish, and that's actually quite, made me quite tearful, because a lot of the veterans talk on it, and they, their outrage, even now, is palpable. Him, Alphonse Mal Mal Machkovia, he talks about this, and he, he bursts into tears. He said, how could they have done that to our splendid general? Yeah. Literally, trash his character. These are Dutchmen who made this book called All Men Are Brothers, and this book, it goes to every single grave, and it gives the owner of that grave a voice, a name, some history, their decorations, which is very, very sweet. And if you want a bit of Polish heritage on your bookshelf, get it, because it's important. It's important. They're just bodies and graves until you read the book, and then suddenly they have names. Um, that's his mate, uh, Franz. And the fact is we're talking about them, and that's important. You'll never see them unless you go to Holland, but we're talking about them, and they deserve that. 2006, the Dutch government said, you know what, enough's enough. They wrote a huge cheque, and they sent air tickets and hotel reservations to every single veteran, and me, and my mother, and my father, and everyone, and said, you will come to this country, and we will do what we should have done 60 years ago. We will be giving the Willems Order, which is the Dutch Victoria Cross, or the Vituti Militari, or the White Eagle, to the Brigade, 
far too late, but better late than never. And to the general, we give the bronze lion, which is like the George Cross, because he did what he did. And so there was, I can't begin to tell you what a day it was. It was like the Trooping of the Colour, but 10,000 times better. That is Queen Beatrix, the Queen of Holland. That is her pinning the Willems Order onto the colour of the um, uh, brigade. That up there is um, a veteran. But look at that. How does he even walk with all their medals? Those are Polish paras who were at Arnhem, at last seeing the justice done. Um, and then there was a big, um, that's the current brigade. Really smart, proud Polish soldiers. And then they paraded the decoration. And that decoration now is with the 6th Airborne Brigade. Um, uh, look at those boys, you know, there it is. It's on their standard now. Uh, that's my father and my uncle. He was um, injured in a car crash, that's why he's uh, paraplegic. And that's them receiving from Queen Beatrix the bronze line. Those are the two medals. That one's currently um, in the, the Hartenstein Museum um, and the Willems Order is at the Brigade. And then, I need to talk about this. This is in Drill. I, un I unveiled this. And it's, a, it's for the Polish, it's for the Polish in the square. And this guy, Major Tony Hibbert, he was a major. And he's a Brit. And he says, this isn't right. The, the Poles were with us. They were standing beside us. And we said they were cowards. And they were getting shot. So he raised several thousand pounds uh, to have that put up. And he was like 88 or something. He should have been playing golf or enjoying his grandchildren. But he died troubled. He, he was a troubled man because this injustice had been done. The British sense of fair play had not been executed. Um, that's me, that is, in 2018. That's the President Duda. I was asked to go and collect the Order of the White Eagle, which is above the Willems Order on behalf of my great-grandfather. And to my delight, him and him, that's my eldest Oliver, and that's Finley, they're trying to look all rock hard and cool as we're standing here with our ties. I mean, especially him. Um, but that's her. She came. And it's the first time the kids have really shown an interest. And I'm delighted, because I hope one day, when I'm too old to give the lecture, either of those boys will do precisely that. Um, and I think that's really fitting. So we went and had a really lovely day, and once again it underlines that the Poles honour their heroes and heroines. Um, or, and funny enough, um, Marie Curie got one as well. It was like 20 Polish heroes and heroines got one. And I wanted to stand up and give a lecture because I lecture about radio chemistry. And I wanted to start to, oh, you know, she discovered Polonium, don't you? Named after Poland, and, um, but I couldn't do that. This is a Polish Secret Service probably shut me up. Um, so there it is, that's the Order of the White Eagle. That's at my house, that's the Legismatia. And um, we went to Warsaw and saw, um, there's loads, there's loads of statues, and this is, there's a, behind that is his house. And so um, there's three little Sosabowskis with one. Uh, old Sosabowski, but also the newest Sosabowski. I don't have any questions to ask her mama because we don't need any DNA testing going on here, boys and girls. Because check that frown <laughs> and check that frown. No, no, she has no questions to ask. I'm quite relaxed. I just had to put that up just because I did. So we are on our last slide. And then what I'll do is I'll open up for Q and A's. I confidently predict you might not want to ask any questions, so I'll wait to ask individual questions. Um, this is a, a scene at the end of a bridge too far. I don't think it really happened, but it's a thing that might happen. Um, so Gavin says, I think that's Paul Newman. Is it Paul Newman? Yeah, I think it is. Who, oh, is it Paul Newman? Who's that? Is that Paul Newman? No, it's, it's that, that guy. Anyway, it looks like Paul Newman too. He says, so that's it, we're pulling out. It's nine million. And then um, Vandeleur, who's Michael Kay, says it was the road getting to nine million. And then Horrocks, which is Edward Fox, James Fox, one of them. No, it was after nine million. And then Browning says, and the fog. And he looks at Sosabowski, and the fog, of course, as if Sosabowski needs an excuse that we didn't know in time. And then he says, no. Um, he, says, no. Um, he says, it doesn't matter what it was. When one man says, well, I know what, let's do today, let's play war games, everyone does. Because it's all about, at the end of the day, people dying. Therefore, we come to the end. Um, what I will give for you is, like, I, 
when I give this lecture, I said I'll arrange a, a handout or something, and Bartek can have the handout. And what you can do for me is just talk about it. Talk about it to your parents. When they say, what did you do this Saturday, instead of revising chemistry or biology, just say, we talked about some guy called Sosabowski, who was a Pole, he did some stuff in Arnhem. And just, and maybe they'll, oh yeah, I know him. Because if we talk about it, it meant it wasn't in vain. And so, um, I'm gonna, we could, I suppose we could listen to the Brigade song, but it's about three minutes long. Do you wanna do that? It's about three minutes, but it's, it, it, I'm sure the Brigade, if it happens, maybe, maybe it's not even connected up. No, it's not. We'll leave that for the time being. But that brings us to the end. You've been really good sports, two long hours, and I didn't see a single phone, so thank you for listening. <laughs> Don't put the coat on yet. We're not done. <laughs> Q&As. I want at least three Q&As, and then I'll let you go. Come on, anything. Good. Have you ever been to the house where um, this sort of train? Uh, large, yes, I did, and I was very disappointed. It's in a big field with cows, and apparently whoever owns it wants it to fall down so they can make a hotel there. But it's a real, it's a real pity because it's a lovely building and a lovely place, and I think in terms of our heritage, it's really important. Because the funny thing, I went to um, Laven in Scotland um, to unveil, they always ask me to unveil the monument. They spent lots of money on this mo monument. And the delightful thing was, I used to bump into veterans. And because they were, they'd been there all their lives, they'd speak Polish with their big moustaches. And then they'd speak English with a beautiful Scottish brogue, beautiful accent. And um, there's a lovely, lovely um, uh, Polish uh, uh, contingent in Scotland. Um, but I'm very sorry about Largo House, because it will fall down, and then they'll build some ghastly hotel on it. Um, no, very, very upsetting. And funny, I'm going to Belfast next Thursday. There's a whole load of poles in Northern Ireland that I didn't know about, because I'm doing a guy called Manchet Battle, got me to do an online lecture um, last year. And I've, I've got two lectures to do in Polish centres and in a Polish club, so it's really, really sweet. For some reason, there's been a big spike in interest which I'm delighted about, because we, we can't stop talking about it. And that's why I'm asking for your help. Talk about it, it's important. Especially with the Ukraine thing. This is what happened. Young, young men and women dying for their country. So, there we are. Two more questions. What, what have you got for me? Right, well, can I tell you the bit which shamed me? When I was young, older than you, when I was a student, and I used to go to see my grandfather, and he used to talk about my grand... You know what? I just wasn't that interested. I was inter We didn't have TikTok and mobile phones then. I just wasn't. I was feckless and youthful, and I wasn't rude about it, but... Okay. And then, I don't know, maybe it's when I had my own children, and um, when he was getting older, he started telling me about his stuff. I just started thinking about it, and I started reading about it. But it's also my family duty. It's a pleasure as well as a duty. But someone's got to do it. And I hope one of my children, one of the boys or one of the girls, does it. Because it's so... And the thing is, a lot of the veterans are dying now. Every time I go to, um, to Arnhem, there's fewer and fewer veterans. They're old. They're in their 80s and 90s. They're dying. Once they die, that's it. We have to remember. So I, I understand how difficult it is to feel gratitude for something that happened 80 years ago. But if it didn't happen, we wouldn't be here now. And your country, our country, it, it would be an annex of Germany. And Poland is a really proud, productive part of Europe. So. One more question and then you're off the hook. Yes, sir. Scotland. It's near Leven. And um, if you ever go to Scotland on a holiday, just say, to, can we go and look at Largo House? Is that all right? And it's actually quite a nice walk, but it's also, you can, you can I'll give um, Bartek this PowerPoint, you can print it out, and you can say, oh yeah, I can kind of see that. And it's very sad though, because it's, it's got trees growing out of the middle of it, so. Okay, that was a quick one, so maybe we can still take one. We can. How do you consider your nationality? How do you... Um, until like about 10 years ago, I thought, oh, I'm English, I am, but a bit Polish, but I've just got my Polish citizenship, so I'm, I'm Polish. And, and so, as a, as a youth, you would consider yourself British, English? I was British, or... and the thing, the thing was, and again, this is, 
you don't know how lucky you are to be here, and I know you don't want to hear that, but I had loads, of, I went to a Catholic school in Ely, so there's a big Polish, yeah. and um, all my Polish mates would go to Polish school on Saturday, and they'd speak Polish at home. But my father married an English woman, and my father, my, God bless his soul, not that he's dead, but um, he was quite lazy about heritage and culture. He didn't speak Polish, and he forgot his Polish. And I'm quite, I'm not angry, but I think, oh, mate, you could have just sent me to Polish school. I wish I'd done that. And when I, I do this lecture around the world, and um, I speak to veterans, and they say, and I, I'm really sorry. I know you just greeted me, but I can't reply appropriately. And I'm quite embarrassed about it. So I want to be more Polish. And I got my Polish birth certificate a month ago, and I've got to go and get my passport. But I feel like I'm a bit of a fraud because I don't speak Polish. So um, I'm just talking to Bartek about some uh, fast track way of learning enough Polish so I, I don't have to be embarrassed about it anymore. A nice question. I'm Polish when it suits. I've been Polish when it suits. No, I'd say no, no. I is Polish. <laughs> I'll hand the floor back to you unless there's any other Q&As. I mean, I can't begin to tell you how delighted I've been to talk about this. And it's been one of the nice lectures I've done in a long time on this matter. We very appreciate you coming here and giving this lecture, but a very engaging lecture with so many materials. Um, Can I give you one so more material? I'd like to give you this book. No, I, I've forgotten. This is my great grandfather's uh, book. It's called Freely I Served, and this is a really nice caricature book that was drawn about him. I'll give it to Bartek. I hope you've got a library or something we can put it in. I'll happily write it. It's my gift to all of you to have you. Very, very coming and thing. telling us the story of your family, and uh, we do hope to see you back for the chemistry. Well, that, I was so. talking about this because actually, I do this, but my in my day job, um, I, I'm on TV quite a lot of the time. But you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> but what, on Sky, look for How on CITV because I do a little thing called Doctor How. But that's not important. What is important is um, one of the big things I do all over the world, including Russia, but no more sadly is I do a science show where I blow things up mainly. It's fire, it's mainly explosions and stuff like that, but with learning outcomes. And we were talking about maybe trying to do both of those things, but it wouldn't have worked. So next thing on the list is to have that science show um, here. It's worth seeing because it's, it's unparalleled in the world. And um, I'd really like to do that because it's a lot of fun. So yes, that's precisely what we'll do. We will uh, arrange in due course. We will see whether it's going to be still this uh, school year uh, or okay. in our anniversary year because this school will have been 70 years um, old uh, from the September uh, new school year. Uh, so uh, I should probably now um, welcome officially, even though you've been here for over an hour now, I think, uh, the worshipful mayor of Slough, Mr. Mohammad Nazir. Uh, about the Polish community in Slough and uh, how uh, you see us here as a part well, of... Well, good afternoon now, but it, I'm delighted and really grateful that you invited me here. Um, although I, I came here in September 1972, and I, I, since then I know the Polish community exists in Slough because our next door neighbour was a, a Polish uh, couple. So, um, but I've always sort of wondered, you know, uh, and, and it, it was... Uh, really eye uh, for listening to your uh, history and, and family. But you said it's your family, but I think it's a Polish history. Uh, and, and it is also important that we, uh, we have links with our heritage and our lineage and our countries and our mother language, which is so, so important. And I'm so happy that you carried on with this school and I hope that it, it prospers uh, and grows more. And thank you very much for, for the invite again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for us again uh, for this uh, very engaging presentation. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, we will uh, see you back soon. Uh, and thank you very much for everyone uh, joining us here today to, to listen to this wonderful story of um, Polish military with uh, one of the 
three heroes of the year right now, the 130th anniversary. They mentioned it was uh, yes. tomorrow, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah so tomorrow is the, the 130th uh, birthday of your great grandfather, General uh, Sosabowski. So um, please do take advice from Professor Sosabowski, who has uh, given us a few links we which we will share. and. Uh, Please continue learning Polish and uh, learning about Polish history. So thank you very much once again.